All right, awesome. So thank you everyone for joining us. My name is McKenna Campbell, and this is our first student education series event. So very excited about it. Um, before Dr. Avidili begins his presentation, I wanna let you all know about our student memberships. They are free and they can be renewed on an annual basis. Student memberships with ACS offer, ooh, if this is gonna let me navigate my screen, maybe not, hang on one moment, here we go. So they offer annual subscriptions to both the cannabis and cannabinoid research and the American Journal of Endocannabinoid Medicine, access to practical clinical handbooks, online video tutorials, and our members only clinical library. There's discounted pricing to ACS medical cannabis educational courses and the certification exam, member pricing to ACS meetings and events, opportunities for networking and mentorship, representation in cannabis advocacy efforts at the federal and local level. So all that is free for students. If you would like to join the association, please reach out to us at info at cannaspecialist.org. And Sarah, if you could put that in the chat, that would be awesome. Again, info at cannaspecialist.org. Um, and it's now my pleasure to introduce Dr. Adam Abadili. Dr. Abadili MD, MBA, FACS, FAS, CRS, so very educated, is a double board certified surgeon specializing, sorry about that, my presentation just moved. Uh, he is specializing in gastrointestinal diseases and cancer. He is a founder and CEO of Adirondack Gastrointestinal and Colorectal Surgery, LLC, and he's been treating patients utilizing cannabis-based therapies since 2010. Dr. Abadili is an esteemed author, presenter, and entrepreneur. He's the CEO and co-founder of Coral Cove Wellness Resort, a cannabis-centric health and wellness resort in Jamaica. And as part of his commitment to advancing the field, he is the former chairman of both the Education Committee and the Dispensary Review Committee for the Association of Cannabis Specialists. In January 2023, Adam joined the Australian-based cannabis company Canum as a medical director for North America. He is assisting in the planning, launch, and operations of the Lumiere mission in North America and internationally. Dr. Abadili, we thank you for your many contributions that have allowed cannabis science to meaningfully advance patient care. I'm very excited to hear what you have to share with us today, so if you'll do me the honor, just take it away. And then I'm going to stop sharing my screen, and I'm going to let you share yours. All right. Let's see. Perfect. All right. So uh, you can see my screen here now. Okay. All right. All right. Very good. Well, thank you for the introduction and thanks for all of you who were able to join this evening or morning or night, wherever you, you might be um, around the globe. I am very happy to be presenting to uh, to this group. I've been a member of the, of the Association of Cannabinoid Specialists now for well over five years. And I've seen the organization grow, um, and I think that this initiative, you know, I'm happy to be the first one, but I think this is a great initiative to be able to, you know, allow students the opportunity to, to be involved with what's going on and to kind of learn from people and their, their real world uh, experience side of things. So um, over the next 30 to 45 minutes or so, I'll, I'll share with you my journey into cannabis therapeutics and, and share with you what I've learned about cannabis for gastrointestinal conditions. So. My journey with cannabis began in, in 2010 when I finished my surgical training. Um, as mentioned, I did training in both general surgery as well as colorectal surgery, which is gastrointestinal surgery with a focus on uh, inflammatory bowel disease, including Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis, but also a variety of um, GI cancers, including colorectal cancers, liver cancers, things of such. And when I when I entered practice in in upstate New York, I I it was really quite shocked to see that there was already somewhat of a cannabis culture that existed. Um, and this was well before New York legalized it. But over you know the years, I began um, becoming somewhat of a a thought leader. Um, I was open to it early on uh, about patients, particularly my cancer patients who are using it for palliative reasons. And, um, and saw the benefit for those patients, which drove my interest in trying to learn how it could, could help um, other patients as well. And throughout the years, you know, I've not only been impressed by cannabis as a medicine, but also seeing how people use cannabis as what I would describe as a, as a wellness tool. I've worked with a variety of not just patients, but athletes, um, including aspiring Olympians, trying to work around the hurdles of, of uh, positive drug tests and, and along with, you know, other, other professionals, including musicians, 
um, who, who use it and artists who use it. And I believe that um, we're, we've got some way to go to destigmatize the, the responsible use of cannabis, but that's certainly been my pursuit. And I've been impressed upon how people um, are using cannabis, not as I mentioned, not just for therapeutic purposes, but also ways to keep them well. And I think that most of us would appreciate or, that the mild to moderate average cannabis consumer is far from the stereotypical lazy stoner, unmotivated, uneducated, you know, individual that people have wrongfully, um, I think, categorized so many cannabis consumers. Um, I don't believe I have any relevant disclosures, but but as mentioned, I'm the medical director for a company out of Australia that is launching uh, medical cannabis clinics here in the U.S. starting at the end of July. And as as mentioned, one of my passions is also in on the wellness side of things. And um, I'm the co-founder and CEO of a wellness, a cannabis centric wellness property in, in Jamaica, which um, I took over about three years ago. And I've envisioned this as a location to further help destigmatize the responsible use of cannabis, uh, along with other plant-based therapies, in, including things like psilocybin, which we currently do um, psychedelic uh, assisted retreats as well. But really, my vision has been to provide, you know, destinations which facilitate education and integrate integration of these substances in the in the background of wellness offerings, you know, that focus on all aspects of wellness, not just physical health, but mental and emotional and spiritual health as well. But today we're going to, you know, I'm going to be sharing with you about cannabis for gastrointestinal conditions. And as mentioned, um, when I first began introducing uh, or if, when I was first introduced to to cannabis, it was with my patients in the context of really debilitating cancers, end of life. And I was actually initially brought in to discourage people from using cannabis. But as I educated myself, I then subsequently educated my colleagues and my onco my medical oncologists to let them know that and, and let them know that I felt that uh, there might be some more reasons than not that these particular individuals might want to consider using cannabis, particularly as a, as it related to an alternative for opioid therapies. But um, early on, I was incorporating cannabis, not just for palliation and pain with cancer, but also for chemotherapy induced nausea and vomiting. And in 2014, when medical cannabis became legal in New York state, it really opened the floodgates for a variety of different patients who are using cannabis for a variety of different gastrointestinal conditions, whether it be things like irritable bowel syndrome, inflammatory bowel disease, a variety of different idiopathic diarrheal conditions but also in, in cases of refractory nausea and vomiting. Um, and I, I think this, in the case of chronic nausea and vomiting, I, I think that one of the things that points to the complexity of, of cannabis as a therapeutic is as it relates to a condition called gastroparesis. For those who aren't familiar with that, gastroparesis is a condition where the stomach doesn't empty properly. It, it remains slow. It doesn't, there are a variety of different reasons it can, it can happen. Um, and one of the things which I'll share with you is that cannabis tends to slow down GI motility. So you, you, we would think that people with conditions like gastroparesis um, would would it would be detrimental to them because it would further inhibit the, their stomach from emptying. But surprisingly enough, a lot of patients with gastroparesis uh, report positive outcomes, and it's probably more on the symptomatic side than it is actually on the on the physiologic motility side. And there was a recent study that came out that pointed to the same, I guess, dilemma, if you will. So uh, there's cases where I have to, where I implant things called gastric pacemakers uh, for people with refractory gastroparesis. But um, in our in our population, there is a large percentage of patients who who uh, utilize uh, cannabis for a variety of their GI motility orders. So. Um, you know, the GI system is a, is a huge complex system of organs, which are all linked physiologically. And the, the system includes not just the intestinal tract itself, um, you know, the pipeway, but it also includes all the organs which support, you know, the, the plumbing, if you will, the pancreas, the spleen, the liver, and an extremely robust um, immune system. And the endocannabinoid system is alive and well in every single cell that lives with every one of these components of the gastrointestinal system. And we, as, as most of you are probably aware or are learning through your studies that the, you know, one of the main jobs of the endocannabinoid system is to maintain a properly functioning system that we refer to as, as homeostasis. And 
The endocannabinoid system accomplishes this by the complex flow of chemical messengers, uh, several of which interact with receptors which are unique to the endocannabinoid system, but also several other receptors which they share, you know, other chemical um, uh, mediators with. An example of this is would be the serotonin receptor. We know that serotonin receptors not only bind serotonin, but they've also been shown to interact with uh, several of other natural endocannabinoids, as well as, you know, the synthetic cannabinoids and plant-based cannabinoids as well. But the gastrointestinal system is, you know, is only one of the systems in which the endocannabinoid system helps to regulate but the GI system just serves so many functions such as a digestion of our food. And it's also involved in the detoxification and elimination of unwanted substances. You know, we ingest, we have to keep in mind that, you know, the, the GI tract really is the first line of defense for, for protection for us that we consume, you know, orally, you know, there's a lot of stuff that we eat that we probably shouldn't be eating. And it's the job of our body to help distinguish that and, and to help eliminate any unwanted um, toxins within our, within our system or, or infections. But one thing that we have learned that we, that we know through a variety of different studies is that the endocannabinoid system plays a major role within the functioning of the GI tract, along with not just the motility, but also with acid secretion, um, the intestinal secretions themselves, um, helps control inflammation, immunity, and tumor surveillance. And then when you, when you, put um, metabolism in the background of all this, you understand just how complex uh, the GI system can, can, can be when it relates to uh, the role the endocannabinoid system can play in, in um, its functioning, as well as disease states. So this is, I put this picture in here just to, to show uh, really some of the you know, some of the, the anatomy of the GI tract, but this, this, and this picture is just of the intestinal tract itself. But what I really want to point out is that within the, within the intestinal tract itself, and it's no different than the liver or the spleen or the pancreas, these are, all these organs have cells, all these cells come together to make different functioning units. Um, there's nerve cells, there's motor cells, mo motor nerve cells, there's sensory cells, of course, and then we also have everything like the blood vessels that supply these, uh, these organs, um, as well as the cells which are responsible for secreting our digestive enzymes. And so all of these cells contain really the three main components of the endocannabinoid system, that being the endocannabinoids themselves, which are the signaling molecules, the receptors, Number two, and then third is the regulatory enzymes, um, which are responsible for, you know, either making the endocannabinoids or breaking them, them down. And this is a somewhat of a complicated uh, slide, but you know, it's but a, but an important one, and it's important to emphasize that every disease of the GI system has been linked to changes in the endocannabinoid system. What we haven't quite figured out yet is whether or not these changes are causal or whether they're compensatory. Now, you know, what do I mean by that? Well, in certain inflammatory states, we might find that cannabinoid type one receptor is upregulated. In some cases it's upregulated by itself, but what we don't know and what we're still trying to figure out is, is the disease uh, itself or uh, is, I'm sorry, is the elevated functioning of the, of some of these uh, cannabinoid receptors or some of the enzymes, are they upregulated or downregulated, which is causing the disease, or are they upregulated as a response from the disease? That's something that we don't fully understand yet. But this table I borrowed from a publication from the American Journal of Gastrointestinal and Liver Physiology from uh, back in 2016. And at the top of the table, you'll see circled a variety of uh, human GI conditions, including diverticulitis, celiac disease, which is from a gluten allergy, uh, irritable bowel syndrome, inflammatory bowel disease, uh, along with colorectal cancer. And on the left side of the table, you'll see the, some of the main components of the endocannabinoid system there circled in red. And, um, and, and you know, the table points to, to mostly human studies with a few animal studies mixed in there. But if you look at the human studies, it should become evident that the endocannabinoid system is altered in these disease, disease states and therefore appears to play an important role in GI physiology um, as, as well as disease. And then in addition to, you know, some of the more common uh, endocannabinoid uh, components of the endocannabinoid system, such as the CB1 receptor and CB2 receptor, 
the GI system is also rich in these other endocannabinoid receptors, such as the TRIP-V receptors, the PPARs, GPR-55, I mentioned serotonin receptors, as well as uh, these fat, fatty acid binding proteins, which play a role in um, our natural endocannabinoids uh, as well. So when, when we talk, we, so we, we can take a step back here and talk about the fact that we have all, there, there's all, there's different types of cannabinoids. We've got, you know, endocannabinoids, which are naturally produced endocannabinoids. We have um, synthetically produced uh, cannabinoids, and then we have plant-based cannabinoids, which are the phytocannabinoids. But broadly speaking, these cannabinoids, admit, when administered to humans, generally result in decreased motility. Uh, this has been documented um, with looking at studies in both humans as well as animals that show that decreased transit times of the stomach, small and large, large intestines have all been demonstrated in the, in the presence of cannabinoid receptor uh, agonists. We also have, have, have seen how cannabinoid receptor antagonists can decrease um, motility. And the primary mechanism uh, of the of the decreased motility appears to be mediated by the CB1 receptor, although other receptors may be involved. Um, the CB1 receptor is the predominant, um, appears to be the predominant motility receptor within the, within the GI tract itself. Um, it, the, the observation was made in the early 1970s that THC diminished intestinal motility in several, several different models by inhibiting the myenteric uh, plexus, which is responsible for the, the motor, motor function of the GI tract. And preclinical studies have demonstrated this, uh, and other studies suggest that the oxidative product of THC, which we know as cannabinol or CBN, might also have the ability to, to diminish intestinal motility, along with FA inhibitors um, have been shown to effectively decrease uh, GI motility as well. We do have some other um, evidence in in vitro and in vivo animal models, which have also shown um, a similar effect with CBD and, and CBN, but these appear to be more um, related to their ability to affect motility by controlling inflammation rather than by a direct um, motility component. So, you know, the, the, the relationship between inflammation and motility can't be understated. You know, diarrhea is a, is a shared symptom among several GI diseases where inflammation is present, whether it's um, a result of inflammatory bowel disease, as the case with Crohn's disease, ulcerative colitis, or the case with celiac disease, which is an allergy to the gluten and wheat products. It could just be a simple environmental allergy. But whenever there is inflammation of the GI tract, this tends to trigger um increased motility and, and increased di diarrhea. So we should keep in mind that the cannabinoids have the ability to decrease inflammation associated with okay. motility, um, but also have the ability to directly affect motility. And of course, so this has several implications um, for us clinically, not, you know, not just diarrheal conditions, but, but other conditions such as, you know, general irritable bowel syndrome, uh, short gut syndrome, which is a condition where uh, if someone has had multiple surgeries on their GI tract, they don't have enough capacity to absorb along with different K types of constipation and other, other slower motility conditions as well, such as constipation and gastroparesis along with, um, nausea and vomiting. So next, we're just going to briefly talk, I'll briefly talk about uh, the role that, ga that cannabinoids might play on gastric acid production. Every, a lot of people are on antacids, but, and increased acid production can cause multiple problems, such as reflux disease, peptic ulcer disease, and likely contributes to several um, forms of irritable bowel syndrome as well. And it's still not fully understood the role that cannabinoids have on gastric acid production. However, most of the data that we have supports the notion that cannabinoids tend to decrease gastric acid production. And in animal models, you know, this has been demonstrated and appears to be a result of, again, the CB1 receptor um, activation. With regards to plant-based cannabinoids, we, even, we have less data on this, but we do have some evidence that THC might cause a reduction in gastric acid secretion, although we're not entirely sure whether it's solely a, a result of its interaction with the CB1 receptor or with other um, interactions uh, as well. You know, increased acid uh, is often associated with gastroesophageal reflux disease. What is gastroesophageal reflux disease? Well, it's basically when acid contents or any stomach contents from your stomach reflux back up into the esophagus. And 
And this is caused by a transient relaxation in what's known as the lower esophageal sphincter. So if that sphincter muscle relaxes, it's more likely that acid can reflux back up into the, into the uh, esophagus and cause a lot of the, the symptoms. But um, it, it's been found in, in animal studies that the area of the brain, which controls the relaxation of the lower esophageal sphincter contains CB1 receptors. And when given um, WIN55, which is an, an antagonist, blocking the signal, signal mechanism was, was found to decrease relaxation of the, the lower esophageal sphincter. So there's clearly some role that the endocannabinoid system plays with, within maintenance of, of the lower esophageal sphincter, but we're still trying to figure that whether there's any clinical utility to that. But, you know, and most of the data is, has, has been mixed on this, but nonetheless, you know, we, we, we have to always say that there's a potential, it has potential considerations for things like reflux disease, as well as esophageal motility disorders um, and, and spasms. The other thing that we taught, we, we like to have an understanding of is how cannabis and cannabinoids affect intestinal secre and fluid secretion. You know, our, our intestines have to secrete fluid, mucus, electrolytes to help us digest food, but also to, to act as a lubricant for our GI tract. And there's certain forms of diarrhea, which is one of them being secretory diarrhea, which is a condition characterized by abnormal electrolytes and, and subsequent fluid absorption. It can be caused by a variety of conditions, whether a medical, whether they're medical conditions for certain medications, infections, or um, patients who've undergone previous intestinal resections can experience uh, this form of secretory diarrhea. In patients with uh, inflammatory bowel disease, improvement in diarrhea is, is one of the many positive attributes reported from cannabis use. Um, unfortunately, there's been somewhat of a, a paucity of the data surrounding this topic, but from some of the preclinical studies we have looking at models of secretory diarrhea, the CB1 receptor, again, appears to be uh, activated in these cases, which cause inhibition of the in intestinal fluid um, secretion. So uh, from the data that we do have, there does appear to be some, some preclinical uh, evidence supporting the fact that activation of the cannabinoid receptors does decrease intestinal fluid secretion. And of course, this could play a role in a variety of different uh, conditions, including diarrhea, constipation, and irritable bowel syndrome. And then what about pain? Chronic abdominal pain is, is uh, a very common presentation to, you know, to our practice. Um, we refer to this type of pain as visceral pain. Visceral pain is any, any pain that originates from either the pelvis, the abdomen, or the chest. And as mentioned, it's a, it's a big cause of visits for both acute as, as well as chronic abdominal pain. And we know that we already know that cannabis has proven benefits for a variety of types of pain. And, and this occurs because of the peripheral and central activation of not just the CB1 receptors, but also the, the trip V receptors. The activation of CB2 receptors as it relates to pain appears to be relevant in the case of disease states, particularly um, in, in cases of uh, increased inflammation. And we do have some preclinical studies in animals showing how individual cannabinoids extracted from crude cannabis um, can might be beneficial, and at least it was in, in beneficial in animal models of intestinal pain, both THC along with CBN was shown to decrease pain levels, which appeared to be a result of the interaction with the CB1 um, receptors. But despite the lack of complete understanding of how cannabinoids uh, decrease visceral pain is still, you know, the, the biggest, one of the biggest reasons that I see the use of medical cannabis in, in my practice. Um, as mentioned, you know, pain can also, and, and diarrhea, a lot of these conditions can also be driven by inflammation. And one of the ways that the endocannabinoid system maintains homeostasis is by controlling levels of inflammation. You know, inflammation is a, it's a double-edged sword. It's, it's a, it's a mandatory step and is a required step in healing and recovery of any, of any injury. However, problems arise when inflammation is excessive, as in, you know, the case of arthritis or autoimmune conditions where ex the, this excess of inflammation leads to tissue damage. You know, this, you see this in cases of rheumatoid arthritis or Crohn's disease. 
But this, this table summarizes some of the anti-inflammatory effects you know, of our natural endocannabinoids, that being anandamide and 2-AG. And there's been several human in vitro models have shown a decrease in several of the pro-inflammatory cytokines, um, such as several of the interleukins as well, including TNF-alpha. While on the other hand, anandamide and 2-AG were also shown to increase levels of some of our anti-inflammatory markers, such as IL-10 and TGF-beta but really getting a better understanding of, of how the endocannabinoids control these in, in, inflammatory markers is something that we're still looking into. Um, this figure is from a recent publication um, or not, published in 20, 2021 in Cannabis and Cannabinoid Research. And in, in this case, they performed a review of the literature to report on the effects of the cannabinoids as, on both pro as well as anti-inflammatory cytokines. And they looked at 26 studies which were eligible for the review, and most of them being in vivo studies, studied the effects of CBD on inflammation. There were 20 studies that looked at CBD, and three of the studies looked at THC alone. In each of the studies, administration of CBD, CBG, or a combination of both CBD and THC led to improvements in several of these inflammatory meters towards an anti-inflammatory environment. And in general, administration of these cannabinoids or in combination of CBD and THC resulted in decreased levels of the pro-inflammatory uh, mediators, that particularly being IL-1, IL-6, and uh, TNF-alpha, while at the same time showed upregulations of some of our anti-inflammatory mediators, such as IL-10. Um, in the three studies where THC was administered alone, there was no decrease in pro-inflammatory cytokines, and there were then there was no increase in the anti-inflammatory uh, in, cytokines as well, pointing towards you know what we we know largely about how THC works you know relative to to, to CBD. So you know I, I've I've shared with you so far you know why pa why patients come to my practice for for cannabis. I've shared with you a little bit about the physiology of how cannabinoids can interact with the GI system. And, you know, it's, it's really interesting when you look back at the literature to see that, you know, this is, this is not new. People have been using cannabis for a variety of conditions of which GI conditions have been some of the most uh, largely reported. Um, you know, cannabis has been used as a medicine now for over 5,000 5, years that we're, we're aware of. And, and in the beginning, it was, it was used for a variety of conditions, but particularly as an anesthetic for surgical procedures and pain, but, but also for a variety of, uh, of GI conditions. Um, during medieval times in, in England, cannabis was described as a treatment options for disease and pain of the innards, which was clearly referring to the intestinal tract. And this was, and it was published in the, um, uh, Old English herbarium during the 19th and 20th centuries. But if you look at why people have historically used cannabis, it's for the same reasons that I'm seeing patients. Cannabis for GI disorders. I forgot. History of cannabis for GI disorders. Oh, hello. Um, so, you know, again, in the literature, you know, you can find, you know, even reports of people using this in antiquity for, uh, you know, diff different types of cannabis preparations for things like, like hemorrhoids, for example. So let's do now take a, as a, as a clinician, take a, take a, now a step back, take that information that we have and really look at this and say, you know, what evidence do we have for this? And I would say with the exception of, of cancer, which I won't, you know, I won't touch during this topic. Um, you know, we do have some evidence, uh, limited, uh, albeit, but nonetheless, we do have some, some evidence for the use of cannabis for chronic pain, nausea and vomiting, irritable bowel syndrome, and inflammatory um, bowel disease. So pain remains the number one medical indication for medical cannabis use in my practice, as well as worldwide, when you look at um, reasons people use it for health conditions. And chronic abdominal pain can arise from numerous different GI conditions and can range from mild pain as the case that we, as in the case that we see patients with ir, irritable bowel syndrome, you know, crampy, occasional crampy abdominal pain. So I consider that more of a mild form of pain or patients can experience significant pain um, in the cases of cancers or a variety of different disease states. And um, where cannabis it can be used as an opioid alternative or an adjunct and has proven to be very beneficial for our patients suffering from gastrointestinal cancers, inflammatory bowel disease, or even in the case of 
undiagnosed abdominal pain syndromes. But in, in 2017, the National Academies of Science, Engineering, and Medicine published their report on the health effects of cannabis. And um, you know, based upon the review of all the relevant literature, they concluded that there is substantial evidence that cannabis is an effective treatment for chronic pain in adults. And this was done after comprehensively looking at a variety of different studies, including 28 randomized controlled trials, 16 quality systematic reviews, and 21 primary research articles. They all varied in routes of administration and types of products. And, and um, they, although it did not uh, specifically talk about GI forms of pain, um, all of these, uh, they, they looked at neuropathies and cancer pains and MS, rheumatoid arthritis, and chemotherapy-induced pain. I think that it's fair, fair enough for us to be able to translate that into uh, the same findings that we would expect when people use cannabis for pain for a variety of different GI conditions. Um, next, we'll look at cannabis for nausea and vomiting. You know, effective treatments for nausea and vomiting continue to remain a challenge across several fields of medicine. You know, we've made a lot of progress in treating acute and chronic nausea since the dis discovery of antagonists of the 5-hydroxytryptamine receptors along with neurokinin receptor antagonists. But despite this, we still have several cases of refractory nausea and vomiting, particularly in the case of chemotherapy-induced nausea and vomiting, where cannabis has proven to uh, be beneficial in many cases. Another challenge that we, we have yet to fully overcome is in the treatment of something called anticipatory nausea and vomiting, which unfortunately affects many cancer patients as well. And this type of nausea is something experienced um, prior to people receiving uh, chemotherapy just in anticipation of the, of the nausea and the side effects. But traditionally, this anticipatory nausea has required things like benzodiazepines, um, but still with you know, limited success. But cannabis continues to prove to be a potential effect, effective treatment for, for this form of anticipatory nausea. And, you know, patients have been using cannabis as, um, you know, for, for a long time now for this. And, uh, and we're just starting to really figure out, you know, why, what works and what doesn't. But um, in, in 2015, JAMA uh, published a meta-analysis where they attempted to summarize, you know, the role of CB1 receptor agonists for chemotherapy-induced nausea and vomiting. And in the, in the review of 28 studies, um, and again, these looked at a variety of different cannabinoid receptors. What they did found is that the cannabinoids were superior to placebo. Um, however, you know, it might be noted that it wasn't statistically uh, significant, but despite this in 2017, also the, the same association concluded that, um, that there is conclusive evidence that oral cannabinoids are effective antiemetics in the treatment of chemotherapy-induced nausea. And we see that uh, as well in our practice when other medications fail. Um, and particularly when people may not want to try this medication, which is Marinol. And Marinol is dronabinol, which is a synthetic form of, of uh, THC. And so it's nice for us to be able to actually, this, this was approved by the FDA in, in the early 1980s for chemotherapy-induced nausea and vomiting, uh, as long, along with AIDS-associated anorexia and weight loss. And this was, this was driven by the demand and the findings and the, the self-reported effectiveness that cannabis consumers were uh, reporting for, uh, for their diseases, for, for particularly for their nausea and vomiting. So the FDA decided to synthesize THC and put it in a, in a pill. And um, you know it's something that we've been prescribing since the early 80s. So we actually have been practicing cannabinoid medicine for you know longer than we have uh, just over the past few years. Um, you know, despite this, I will say that you know Marinol tends not to be nearly as effective as um, as uh, cannabis itself, probably due to uh, the other components, uh, the other cannabinoids, as well as potentially even some of the, the terpenes and other secondary compounds which may exist within a full extract of, of cannabis. So, you know, we, we, we've spoke, you know, we, we've talked about, you know, pain, we've talked about nausea and vomiting. Now we can, we can touch on irritable bowel syndrome. So, you know, irritable bowel syndrome is a, it plagues the, it plagues the U S um, about 15% of the U S population um, reports some form of irritable bowel syndrome. You know, there's diarrhea predominant, um, co there's constipation predominant, or there's mixed cases of irritable bowel syndrome, but in either case, you know, patients talk about a lot of the same, 
um, symptoms, abdominal pain, bloating, lethargy, emotional irritability, and of course, alterations in, in their bowel habits. And the etiology is not fully understood. It appears to be multifactorial, such, you know, pe people who have alterations in their immunity, uh, in their immune system within their GI tract can suffer from IBS. If you have abnormal bacteria, what we refer to as dysbiosis, this can lead to a, a dysfunctioning GI system. If you have chronic inflammation or low levels of inflammation, and one of the things that I think is particularly interesting as it relates to irritable bowel syndrome is that there have been polymorphisms of the gene which encodes the CB1 receptor as well as the FA gene, which have been linked to several forms of, of IBS. And um, I think it makes it a, th these um, make it a great target for potential therapies uh, looking at how can cannabis might affect particular individuals, you know, we, one of the challenges with cannabis continues to be of who is it going to help and who is it not going to help. And certainly if somebody came into our practice and we could diagnose them as having a polymorphism of one of these genes, which encoded for that, then it might be more likely that we would prescribe a cannabinoid type therapy as opposed to other medications, pharmaceuticals that we have available to, to medically treat um, IBS. But we, we also have human colon biopsy studies, which have shown increased um, activity of the TRPV receptors in, in IBS as well. So it's nice to be able to see that, you know, we're, we're starting to understand, you know, this, not just at the, at the level of the you know, animal models, but we're starting to really dive down into this, into the, you know, the genetics and, and how that results in translational um, outcomes. And, if we look specifically at cannabinoids, unfortunately, most of the studies that we have are simply looking at um, TA, the, the synthetic uh, THC, dronabinol. So again, not, not looking at whole plant cannabis, but in any event, despite the proposed benefits of having these other cannabinoids, even with synthetic THC, the studies have largely shown a decreased colonic transit time, decreased abdominal pain, and subsequent decreased frequency of, of, uh, of bowel movements. And, and la the last disease, which I'll touch on here, is inflammatory bowel disease. You know, inflammatory bowel disease is an autoimmune condition where your bo our bodies essentially attack their own normal native cells. Um, it's, there's two main categories, Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis. One of the things that has been reported is that uh, the large number of IBD patients who actually consume cannabis, um, uh, there's, re there's reports that it may be as high as 50%. I certainly think that fits with, you know, my practice uh, patterns that I've seen of people who have inflammatory bowel disease with self-reporting cannabis use. It probably is close to closer to 50% than it is to some of the lower studies, which reported around 10%. One of the things that we, we keep finding with cannabis and inflammatory bowel disease is that the self-reported outcomes are extremely positive. Unfortunately, most of our studies have been questionnaires or perspective, smaller perspective studies. And in these studies, we have set several people who will report um, complete remission. Some people will re com report complete remission of their disease. Um, decreased medication use, decreased need for surgery and decreased symptoms. But one of the things that I've been, you know, most impressed upon is just the quality of life indicators have all been positive in pretty much every study. And, uh, you know, I think that that some of that points to how cannabis might actually just affect a disease in multiple ways. It's not just about the inflammation, but somebody with inflammatory bowel disease may have increased, you know, uh, abdominal, they might have increased abdominal pain, increased irritability, both um, their G, with their GI tract, as well as their uh, emotional irritability. And if that improves their quality of life, then I think that that's, you know, a positive um, outcome. But in, in 2019, there was a report published that looked at data from the national inpatient um, sample database where they looked at over 6,000 records of patients with Crohn's disease and over 1,400 patients with ulcerative colitis. And of the 6,000 Crohn's patients, half of them re reported cannabis use um, dur during the study. And these patients had less of an incidence of the development of cancer, which patients with inflammatory bowel disease are more prone to get. They were uh, less likely to require IV nutrition um, they had lower rates of anemia and their 
uh, hospitalizations were associated with shorter stays as well as decreased costs to the healthcare system. And in those patients with ulcerative colitis, approximately half of them also used cannabis. And in those cases, decreased rates of infection uh, were reported along with lower hospitalization rates and decreased costs as well. You know, despite all these positive outcomes, you know, patients with Crohn's disease did report some increase in other complications such as bleeding, fistula, or abscess formation. But knowing how complex Crohn's disease or inflam and, and inflammatory bowel disease in, in general, hard to, to link, um, you know, to say that cannabis was the cause of, you know, the increased rates of, of bleeding. But several other studies have been published, and these are largely smaller studies. Here are, you know, a few, just a few of those studies, which ranged anywhere from 13 to 30 patients. And overall, the use of, of cannabis in patients with inflammatory bowel disease has been largely positive, with general improvements in clinical response, um, quality of life, weight gain, and overall satisfaction. What we what we don't have and what we need is more evidence that that cannabis is affecting the disease at an inflama at an inflam inflammation level. Um, it would be nice to know if the you know cannabis is simply helping the symptoms or is it actually aff affecting the disease and that we don't we don't know. But the the data that is in the literature parallels the data that we collected from our own practice. In uh, 2018, we decided to just look at 20 consecutive patients who were beginning medical cannabis treatment for their inflammatory bowel disease. And again, we didn't do any um, bi you know, intestinal biopsies or anything like that, but we simply followed a lot of the other previous study protocols, questionnaires, and overall, uh, over the course of 12 months, we also, you know, all, all patients um, with the exception of two reported uh, the decreased use of rescue medications and decreased symptoms, but every, all 20 reported improvements in quality of life. So once again, it, it's hard to figure out exactly what's going on in these cases, but, but nonetheless, I believe that cannabis is affecting patients with inflammatory bowel disease and other GI um, problems really at a multifactorial uh, level. Um, a couple of years ago, uh, one of the previous graduates from the University of Maryland by uh, name is Sabina Rasulov. We we're just in the process of um, uh, submitting a paper here for, for publication. Um, one of the things that I've always been intrigued about are some of the minor cannabinoids as well and their potential role. And uh, as as an, any of you who are involved in, in the therapeutic application of cannabis, you will be asked these questions. You'll be asked, what is the role of not just THC and CBD, but what are the roles for things like CBC, CBG, CBN, and some of these other acidic cannabinoids? And so I wanted, I got, I've always received a lot of questions um, from patients and just general consumers of cannabis, how some of these minor cannabinoids might affect the GI tract. And um, so we decided to, to do a very extensive review of the literature up to 2022 to review the minor cannabinoids um, specifically as they're related to the GI system and, and GI disease. And we're in the process of, of submitting this for publication, but I figured since it was relevant to the topic and, and also I know that there's several students from the University of Maryland, I thought I would just share with you some of our, some of our findings. Um, you know, briefly, uh, CBC, cannabichromine, one of the other minor cannabinoids, um, has been studied. What we found in, in several animal models that were meant to mimic uh, colitis models. So whether they're meant to mimic infl uh, inflammatory bowel disease or infectious colitis um, was not specified, but in either case, they induced um, colitis in, in animal models. And when CBC was administered, they reported decreased inflammation through the pro-inflammatory uh, mediators, but also diminished uh, nitrate levels. Um, and this, this also in, in, the, in the full animal models, they also did show that CBC was associated with de uh, decreased motility, again, just like uh, THC, as well as restoration of the epithelial barrier. Um, cannabidrol, we found a few studies where they did, they looked at the same colitis models and again, found the same pattern of normalization of several of the cytokines, which were seen to be pro-inflammatory, but CBG is, was also, um, found to be inhibitory on the growth of some colorectal cancer cells. Again, these are 
purely preclinical studies. Um, and, and there was also some um, evidence that CBG may actually be pro-emetic, may have some pro-emetic properties to it, which um, raises some interesting questions about why CBG might cause some people to feel, feel nauseated. But, but that is also um, has led to the, the topic and discussion of whether or not some people who develop nausea from uh, from cannabis products might be a result of, of CBG. Now, again, these are all preclinical studies, but again, just wanted to share with you what is out there in the literature. Um, CBN, which is the oxidative product of, of THC, has also been shown to, you know, interact with our cannabinoid and trip receptors and has also been shown to be, you know, a weak inhibitory and inhibitor of GI motility. And um, CBDV, which uh, I find uh, one interest, we found one interesting study on this because they actually did get um, pediatric patients with ulcerative colitis and did report decreased um, inflammation in patients with ulcerative colitis. I would have liked to see it be a much larger study, but, but nonetheless, at least the, we do have some evidence that in this case, um, the cannabinoids and that being CBDV did actually result in decreased inflammation. And then we wanted to look at the two acidic cannabinoids. Um, I particularly like uh, the acidic cannabinoid THCA. I think it's something that I'm hoping we get more information on. As you know, it's in the, in the non-decarboxylated form of THC, has a low affinity for binding of the lower affinity than um, you know, the, non the, the non-acidic uh, neutral form THC for the CB1 and CB2 receptors. But nonetheless, the, one of the main advantages of it is that it doesn't have any psychoactive effects. And one of the challenges with cannabis medicine in general and its acceptance is due to its, some of the intoxicating properties of it. So any sort of data and information and, and support that we can gain from uh, you know, the non-psychoactive component of, of uh, cannabis, it will be beneficial towards the, you know, the growth of um, uh, the acceptance rather of, of uh, cannabis. So you know, just some, just some concluding remarks. I will say that, you know, cannabis consumption among patients with GI conditions is extremely common, very prevalent, and is very unlikely to go away. Most of the, most of the data that we have is positive for its use, but again, it's most of it's anecdotal or smaller, um, you know, non, non-clinical studies, we'll call them. Um, we've just begun, we, we need more in-depth depth search, uh, in-depth research about understanding the physiology of some of these pharmacological agents, particularly some of the individual cannabinoids, but more importantly, how they work together. There, and we also want to keep in mind that there are significant, there are some significant risk and side effects associated with conventional pharmaceuticals, as is there is with cannabis, but these side effects appear to be, um, comparable, if not favorable, relative to several of the the, can, the pharmaceuticals for GI conditions currently that we have available to us. Um, we have we have good preclinical data, but we, we need more clinical data. And there's a lot of unanswered questions, such as which cannabinoid and terpene formulations are most beneficial. Um, routes of administration continues to be a challenge, particularly in the GI world, because uh, I tend to steer people, particularly with inflammatory conditions or motility conditions, uh, initially towards inhalational products. Why? Because I don't know if somebody has inflammation and they take an oral product, how much of that they're actually absorbing. Um, if they have forms of secretory diarrhea, they may not absorb some of some of the cannabinoids. And so that can certainly make uh, dosing quite uh, challenging. And so I, we, it would be nice if we could get a better handle on that. And we also need to learn how much genetic variations affect uh, cannabis pharmacology and outcomes. As mentioned, we, we have evidence that the endocannabinoid system is, is altered in disease states. We know that in irritable bowel syndrome, we have genetic deficiencies, which can, which can cause the disease, which will make it hopefully a target for, um, for therapy. But really understanding how much individual you know, genetic variation plays in, in this is, is, is yet to be determined. But it's, um, it's no different than any other medicine. You know, there's, you know, me medicine, not every medicine works for everybody. And the reason is, is because of individual diseases, as well as our own genetic variability. And cannabis is not, no different than that. 
But um, I would also like us to hoping that we're eventually going to develop formulations of cannabinoids, which only act on the periphery. Again, if, if something is focused on inflammation of the GI tract in order you know, to have it cross the blood brain barrier and cause intoxicating effects with, uh, you know, as in the case with THC, it would be nice if we could avoid that um, all in all to increase the continued acceptance for cannabis. So um, with that, I, that's the end of the presentation. Um, I'm happy to answer any questions. Uh, questions here. I'm looking on our box to see if we have any. Um, I see one question here that says, is there any research on antidepressants and the endocannabinoid system tone? I, I don't know the answer to that. It's a great uh, question. Um, my, my suspicion is that uh, it, it certainly would affect it. Um, if people, uh, you know, typically depression is associated with anxiety, they tend to go hand in hand. And so, you know, when we think about people as having anxiety, uh, frequently we think about these overactive nerves. And so it would be unreasonable to think that somebody with, um, who, who is on antidepressants is, or, or not is going to have alterations in, in some of the, the functioning of the endocannabinoid system. Um, Another question came in is how many endocannabinoids beyond anandamide and 2-AG appear to be involved with GI dysfunction? Uh, well, we we don't, I, I don't know if we know the answer to that. We we know that the same endocannabinoids, not just AEA and 2-AG, but also OEA and PEA and some of these other um, endocannabinoids are present um, within the GI system, but I don't believe that we have any Listen, we've got a lot, a lot of information on, on the, the cannabinoid agonists, uh, particularly dronabinol, but, um, but unfortunately when it comes to some of the, you know, either the, either the, the plant-based cannabinoids or our natural endocannabinoids, we don't have a lot of great information on that yet. Um, are there any... Are there many studies or results to replace uh, over-the-counter pharmaceuticals with cannabis medicines, e.g. Tums, Metamucil, Pepto-Bismol? Uh, there, there are no studies to my knowledge. Um, however, this, the, the discussion of replacing uh, a pharmaceutical with a can, cannabinoid supplement or a product of any four storms is, is, something, is a question that we're frequently um, confronted with. Uh, Again, you know, if if somebody reports to me personally that cannabis works as well as uh, a, an over, a prescription strength and acid, for example, which you know might happen from time to time, I'm sure I certainly wouldn't discourage them from utilizing cannabis as opposed to the pharmaceutical, um, an approved pharmaceutical, I should say, for for a particular GI condition, um, knowing this is assuming it's being done responsibly. Remember, any of these medications, even even antacids um, are not without risk. You know, antacids now have been linked to increased rates of uh, this nasty bacterial infection of the gut called Clostridium difficile or C. diff runs rampant in hospitals. And um, so, you know, we, there's always a push for us to trial alternative therapies or, you know, natural therapies, hoping that they won't have some of the same negative side effects that some of the conventional pharmaceuticals would. Um, there's another question here that states, can you help me understand the link between gut health and mood and the vagus nerve? Well, that's a very, uh, comp that's a very complex uh, question. Um, we have a lot of, inf we have a lot of evidence right now that our, our mood can be affected by our gut health and by our gut health, we're referring to the, um, the the probiosis, the environment, the bacterial environment within our within our gut. It's it's uh, it's quite impressive how many uh, diseases uh, are linked to dysbiosis of the gut and how many symptoms can be effectively controlled with um, restoration of a normal um, bacterial load within the within the GI tract. We also know that there's a, a communication between the healthy bacteria in the gut and the endocannabinoid system. And, and we, there, if you look at alterations in the gut micro, microbial uh, content, there are certain makeups uh, which, have been, which have been linked to obesity as well as different mood disorders. Now, that, of course, that's gonna play somewhere into the vagus nerve, but, uh, but that interaction is not fully understood. 
Um, what's the best form of cannabis to use for uh, chemotherapy patients for anti-nausea considering edibles seem counterintuitive? Well, a lot of that depends upon uh, what uh, the patient's status is. Um, we will frequently use, um, so as, as in the case with head and neck cancers, it's hard, you know, if someone has a, has a horrible case of head and neck cancer, they're not going to be able to inhale anything. They're not going to be able to consume anything edible. In these cases, most people will have, you know, something like a feeding tube, for example, um, in which case, you know, any, any sort of oral compound, whether it be a tincture or a crushed up capsule or pill can be, can be instilled into a feeding tube. Um, but with, with cancer patients too, I, uh, I've, I've found a lot of success with the, with the inhalational form as well. Um, you know, the, the oral routes of administration are, are oftentimes, um, or sometimes as you say, associated with a little more psychoactivity, uh, given Delta nine, uh, uh, hydroxy THC, 11 hydroxy THC. Um, which is created when, when THC goes through the liver and this molecule tends to be not, not as tolerable for a, a lot of people. And, and, and I, and I keep that in context of what other medications an individual might be on. If they're on opiates, you know, the thought of adding something else, which could be, um, you know, a little intoxicating, we have to be mindful of to avoid any other unwanted side effects. Um, there is a question, uh, let's hear for anticipating. So um, a, a question here about anticipatory nausea and vomiting. Would you suggest using inhalation as the primary route of administration or do you favor vaporization um, of flour to vape liquids or smoking uh, a joint? You know, it's it despite the fact that um, we don't, we can't say that smoking cannabis is horribly harmful to our health. We also can't say that consuming a, inhaling a, com, a combusted product of any sorts is in anybody's particularly best interest. So I tend to steer people away from smoking in the form of combustion. Um, my, my preferred route for a lot of these patients is, uh, in, still the inhalational route. And I think if, if the dry flower can be vaporized, that's always the, the preference. Now, with vaporization of the dry flour, there's two types. There's conduction and there's convection. And you know the the conduction is is a heating element which heats up the product and can still give you a little bit of combusted product in there. Where the convection is kind of like a, I liken it to a hair dryer holding a you know oil in front of a hair dryer. And in, in those cases, that, that tends to be the, you know some of the more pure um, form. The, the and and af, after that, I I tend to recommend the vape cartridges after that with the, the challenge and that being is again, is that we don't have great control over some of these handheld uh, pocket vaporizers, the batteries themselves, how truly hot are they? Um, are they getting that oil and are they causing any combustion in the, in the um, background of it? So um, uh, I, I don't have, there's one question about um, patients with primary sclerosing cholangitis, uh, again, it's an autoimmune condition frequently, um, linked with, uh, with inflammatory bowel disease. Um, no research on this, but, um, but again, knowing how cannabis, no, knowing about sclerosing cholangitis, knowing that it's a disease caused by a, an autoimmune condition, it's certainly not unreasonable to believe that there may be a role for the use of cannabis with PSC. Um, the last question here is, are suppositories effective and does that limit or eliminate psychoactive effects? Uh, it will not eliminate all the psych psychoactive effects. Um, people can still have the same uh, effects. The, the rectum is actually a, a very rich network of, of um, veins that can be utilized for absorption. Um, and the it, it's a great, it, it's it's a great option in the sense that we know it works, but it's very challenging to get people to buy in still. I found taking a suppository when there's other options. Um, not many people are too thrilled about uh, applying a suppository if they know that there's another route of administration. However, I think that uh, if we could get buy in, I think that there, there's a tremendous opportunity for um, a suppository administration. Um, and there was a question here about, which I guess I just didn't fully understand. What about botanicals for the use with GI disorders? And I guess I'm not entire, 
really sure about um, what you mean by botanicals, if you're referring to the entire plant or not. Um, uh, so I don't entirely know how to answer that question, but but uh, but certainly botanicals play a role in in a variety of GI conditions, not just cannabis itself. So uh, essential oils or, or herbs, yes, there there's a variety of different um, essential oils or herbs which may be beneficial, particularly in the in the in the case of um, um, there's a few that actually that which which uh, come to mind. But of course, peppermint oil right now is one of the, the, the most commonly used essential oils that we find to be effective in patients with uh, irritable bowel syndrome. It's been shown to calm down motility as well as uh, inflammation of the GI tract. So um, peppermint oil, as well as, as, well as oils, which are, are rich in um, the terpene beta caryophylline, which is a, is a great anti-inflammatory and, and I find to be very effective in, in, in some as well. So, uh, you know, with that, um, I will, uh, here's my, I went back to the, the first slide, which has my email address there. If you have any questions, feel free to reach out to me. And it's been a, a pleasure chatting with everybody. And uh, I wish everybody the best of the luck um, with their studies and their life endeavors. And, um, and I want to thank the ACS as well as, as for putting this on. And I would also highly encourage those who are not members to please, please join. We look, we look forward to having you in our discussions. Awesome. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Abadili. I feel like I learned so much right now. So thank you for that. Um, and again, yes, just like he said, anyone who wants to join the association, please do. It's free for students. Um, thank you all for coming. We are planning our next event for the end of September. We're planning on them being quarterly, so please be on the lookout for that. It will probably be the last Tuesday, but we shall see. Um, again, thank you all so much, and I hope you all have a great night. Thank you.